Welcome everyone to the third of four sustainability webinars we will hold this spring um, 2019. My name is Karin Verschuren. I'm a doctoral student here at Teachers College and I'll be your host today. Um, this pilot series was initiated by the Teachers College Initiative for Sustainable Futures and the series is sponsored by the Office of Digital Learning with the goal to leverage technology to connect research experts and teachers. In the past two webinars, we've traced the history of environmental and sustainability education and talked about climate change and the need for collective and individual action. And today we're trying to think outside the box. Uh, we'll tackle school climate or the effect of sustainability initiatives on school climate and social emotional learning. So I'm excited to introduce our three speakers for today. On my left here is Sonali Rajan, who's Assistant Professor of Health Education at Teachers College Columbia University. We'll provide an overview of the ways in which New York City school teachers can draw on school climate research to inform practice. Um, she's joined, or we will be joined shortly by Paul Clark, who's the Vito Marcanta Marcantonio Peace Garden Coordinator and the Nominal Sustainability Coordinator at CPE2. Uh, and last but not least, we're also joined remotely by Shakira Provazoli, who, will, who is an environmental science teacher and the sustainability coordinator for PS333. Uh, uh, we're using Zoom as our technological platform, and for those of you who have, who have not used it before, I'll take a minute to explain some of the functionality. You basically have only three buttons. Um, I've muted all the participants, so you won't hear any background noise. Um, and we, uh, on the left, at the bottom on the left, you have the chat function. We'll be monitoring that all along. Um, if you have any questions or any concerns, you can send them through the, the, the chat function. If you have any questions for the panelists, however, use the Q&A option at the right. Uh, only use that button for questions because we cannot keep track of the chat function throughout um, the webinar. So let me begin by introducing Sonali Rajan. Oh, there we go. Um, so Sonali Rajan is a Doctor of Education, Health and Behavior Studies here at Teachers College. Her research is focused on identifying patterns of risk behavior among adolescent youth, uh, implementing and evaluating school-based health education programs, and identifying environmental level characteristics that influence health behavior among urban youth and communities. In line with the approach of the whole child, her research embraces a comprehensive definition of health, recognizing that the synergy between multiple health issues and the surrounding environments together inform long-term outcomes. And for the past several years, Dr. Rajan has worked on the implementation and evaluation of health education and behavioral health initiatives aimed to mitigate youth engagement in high-risk behaviors and promote positive youth development. She has an emerging line on research of research in the area of aggression and violence prevention in schools and is focused on supporting efforts aimed at reducing the presence of firearms in K-12 school settings. So welcome, Sonali. Thank you. So, um, can I, so it's great to be here and to be here with you all today. Um, thank you so much, Corinne, for being our fearless leader and organizing this. I'm, I'm just really, um, it's, it's rare to have the opportunity to bring together researchers and practitioners, and I think this is a really uh, wonderful opportunity, certainly for me to be able to share a little bit about my work and draw on the experiences of others. Um, so the title of our uh, webinar today is School Climate and Student Learning, Thinking Outside the Box. And as Corinne very kindly just introduced, um, I am a faculty member here in the Health and Behavior Studies Department at Teachers College. Um, and I'm also uh, involved quite closely with the Teachers College Initiative for Sustainable Futures. And so this is an initiative that I've been working on closely with my colleague, Dr. Pismoni Levy, Dr. Cook, and others across the college here to try and reconceptualize and think creatively and also effectively about environmental and sustainability education efforts in the school system. So today's agenda, and I'm thinking about um, this as a, I'm gonna move my slide down. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Uh, there we go. Okay. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, you, you think you get all the tech part worked out and then of course, I'm always fumbling at the beginning there. So apologies. So today's agenda, um, we'll really have three pieces to it. The first is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between youth well-being, which in, in the research, we, we refer to that really as indicators of health, but broadly speaking, the well-being of children and learning outcomes. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that has informed my understanding of the school environment and why we should care about the school environment and its relationship relationship to these various outcomes. Um, and then I'm going to tie in an example of um, the exposure to green space, opportunities for outdoor play, and how what the research shows, how that is related to improved mental health outcomes in youth. It's just sort of a nice example of bringing this all together. Um, and so, uh, as always, please make note of any questions and I'm, I'm happy to answer them uh, at the end of our, towards the end of our, our webinar today. So, I'm, I'm saying this and I kind of, I had to chuckle a bit to myself as I was putting this slide together because I don't think there's a single teacher um, or perhaps parent that doesn't know this, um, but certainly the notion that there is an inextricable link between a child's quality of health and their well-being and their ability to learn. And in my research, I am less interested in uh, things like outcomes such as test scores and things like that, although those are important to some degree. But I'm really talking about, when I say learning outcomes, I'm really talking about is a child motivated to learn, ready to learn, engaged in their classroom environment, those kinds of things. And this certainly draws on some wonderful research that's been done by my colleagues um, and that I've been able to conduct as well. Um, you know, we say that this is something that feels very obvious. Um, children need to be healthy and happy in order to thrive in their school climate and their school classroom. Um, but historically, school reform efforts and really much of education policy has not consistently incorporated or acknowledged even the role of various health factors on youth learning outcomes. And so I'm underscoring this today because that, that connection is not always actively stated, and I just wanted to underscore how that kind of drives my thinking in my work. Um, oh, okay. uh, so, all right, now what do I mean by inequities in health? So uh, one of, uh, this again, drawing on the research of some of my colleagues, um, we, we coined this term, um, so one of my colleagues coined this term, educationally relevant health disparities in his 2011 work. Um, and what that means is these are, these are um, health issues that disproportionately tend to impact urban minority youth, although they do impact other children as well, and that we know there's a causal link to poor uh, to disparities in educational outcomes. And so in his work, he talks quite a bit about a number of different factors, and I'm highlighting just a couple of these here, um, ac having access to wholesome breakfast and lunch, um, having access to comprehensive vision, hearing, and oral health screenings. Um, and the two that I wanted to highlight that are relevant to our conversation today are having access to and daily opportunities for physical activity, and classrooms and or school-wide efforts that promote a safe, support supportive and thriving climate. And so I offer this as a, a way to think about, um, you know, the whole child and, and thinking about their needs, not just sort of in isolation, one thing at a time, but rather everything that a child needs every single day to perform and to thrive at school. So the question that I pose is, can a school's environment help address these disparities in learning by shaping a student's ability to learn effectively and also simultaneously, simultaneously improving their quality of health? And this is a question that I come back to quite a bit in my work uh, when I think about the programs that I engage with and the conversations I have with teachers um, and in the efforts of our students how are we, what is, it, what is happening in the school's environment? And so just to briefly um, kind of talk through this a bit. So how, does, how do K through 12 schools in New York City currently operationalize environment? Because in my work and 
in, in today's conversation, I'll be coming back to that term quite a bit. So what do I really mean by that? So if you take a look at, let's say, the New York City Department of Education Sustainability Report, or you go through the website, you'll see things like this. So you'll see sustainability goals and you'll see facilities as structural issues and together this sort of informs the way in which we think about environment in a school. So some of these include efforts to reduce water consumption, uh, increase water efficiency, um, green curriculum efforts which involve integrating uh, environmental education efforts into classrooms, um, and then similarly structural issues. So heat and air conditioning, um, air quality in the neighborhoods where, the, where kids live and even on their commute to and from school, um, even the type of paint that's used in classrooms. So these are all issues that have been looked at by environmental health researchers and these are all issues that are currently being addressed and acknowledged by the New York City school system in terms of how they try, the, how they're seeking to um, shape our child, our children's environments um, in the classroom. Now, all of this is very important, and I, I think this is, this is critical to having safe and secure schools, um, but I'm going to offer something else in addition to that, and that is while the physical environment of a school and its classrooms are so important, there are other elements of a school's climate which acknowledge the social and the emotional aspects of learning and also child development that must also be integrated into conversations and efforts on the school's physical environment. And what I have found really fascinating, again, in my own work and drawing on the work of others, is that there is a significant and growing body of research that con has confirmed the relationship between a positive school climate and improved mental well-being, emotional well-being, um, reduced rates of engagement in a wide range of risk behaviors, and naturally, and by extension, then improved uh, academic outcomes. Now you might be wondering, well, what do I mean by positive school climate? And so on these next two slides, I want to take a moment to just talk about this a little bit and offer also just a moment to maybe reflect on what this means for you and for your school. So currently there is no um, uh, a limited or defined set of this, these are the indicators a school must have in order to say, check, they have a positive school climate. It's an evolving construct. It's one that can look different from school to school. But here are just a few ways in which we currently operationalize indicators of school climate. So for example, um, positive student teacher relationships. Um, students who feel safe at school, not just in their classrooms, but also in non-classroom areas. So in the cafeteria, in the hallway, um, on their commute to and from school, out at the playground. And so what are schools doing to think about safety and, um, and inclusiveness in those spaces? So that's something I'm really interested in in my work. Um, teachers who are supported via the provision of certainly adequate materials and resources, um, in-classroom teaching assistance, regular professional development, all of that in addition to a safe physical classroom environment. So the idea that the social emotional well-being of school staff is equally as important as the well-being of the children in, that they are working with. And then lastly, but certainly not in any way least today, is access to green spaces on and off campus. And I'll talk a little bit more about this over the coming slides. Now, if we actually go, there is a National School Climate Council, and um, they do some really interesting, wonderful work, and they actually define school climate, climate as the norms, values, and expectations that support people feeling socially, emotionally, and physically safe. And so this can be, and often is, reflected in a school's physical space as well. And this is something where I think a lot about how do we normalize certain practices around sustainability efforts, around the ways in which we interact with students, um, in the ways in which we uh, discipline students. What do those practices look like? What are we normalizing? What are we not? And how do we, and how are those expectations shaped by, you know, certain biases and how we come into the, a school space? So this is sort of a, a broader set of, uh, a broader construct, but I, I think it's important to underscore how this all comes into play. Now, 
what I'm what I've done on the next couple of slides is actually just I wanted to share a few visual examples of um, ways in which New York City schools are taking this charge and really thinking creatively and if some might say outside the box about how they can promote a positive school climate. And so in putting actually these this presentation together, I actually shared, I was showing some of these pictures to a few, a few um, parents and teachers um, and a couple kids that I work with in some of my other work. And I asked them, and maybe this is something we could all do just for a moment, we could all just take a moment to think about it, but what are some of the words or just reactions that come to mind when you see spaces like this. And as you're thinking about that, I'll just share some of the words that were coming to mind with my colleagues that I was working with. So um, a couple of the kids said um, colors and plants. Um, and one of the teachers that I work with said joy, um, which I loved because they're that's that's the ideal, right? Is that classrooms and schools should be spaces of joy. Um, one of the kids I work with said happy. Um, a parent I worked with said access, which I thought was really a, a, an important point, you know, having just access to or being in proximity to um, spaces that might allow for this kind of use. And we know if we kind of look at various ways in which schools are, are really taking the charge on how do we integrate green spaces into schools, into school spaces. So obviously in New York City, we have to be very creative about uh, green space and outdoor time as well. And so I just wanted to share a couple examples you can see here, um, planters and um, ways in which kids are, there are school gardens and one of our wonderful colleagues here at TC, Dr. Cook has done a lot of work in this area um, using rooftops of buildings to really cultivate some greenery. And then I'm sharing this one example here that I actually found when I was just doing a little research online. Um, this is in Brooklyn, um, the idea of a school and a community partnership coming together to build what they call the green infrastructure. And in this particular playground you see in the bottom right, um, what they've done is they've actually built uh, uh, an infrastructure that's underneath this green turf here, um, and it actually collects rainwater um, that can be used and repurposed in certain ways. And so, just you know, again, we're this. I'm offering these as just options and or just ideas to sort of spark some, if nothing else, just creativity or ideas as we think together on how we might try to create some joyful, happy, <laughs> green spaces. As my as my students were sharing with me. And so if we go back now to the way in which we were thinking about how the way in which New York City schools currently think about sustainability. So if you go back to the sort of list of things I shared earlier, um, I want to highlight two here. So the idea, so ecology efforts and then schools proximity to green spaces. And now let's just think for a moment by investing in these efforts, how do these efforts improve the well-being of our students? And that is a question that we are asking in the research and trying to see how we can be translate that effectively into practice. And that's where I'm hoping to also just learn and, and um, from others today as well, just because this is this is this is not an easy question per se to answer. Now there is what we do know, and this is, I think, really promising, is that there is some really interesting research that has looked at this to some degree. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So first is that, so if we look at green space um, and outdoor play and its relationship to mental health, and we kind of draw on that as a little bit of a, a case study. So um, we know and research confirms that there is a significant association between proximity to green spaces and the improved mental well-being of children. And I should actually add that we do know that the same relationship exists for adults as well. And I think, I know I can attest to that even just 10 minutes probably walking by a park can improve my mood considerably and keep me more alert. So there, we, we kind of know that intuitively, um, but we know that the research has confirmed that there is that relationship. Um, and more specifically, what some work has shown is that access to green space is specifically associated with um, 
uh, in, in addition to improved mental well-being, but things like attention restoration, um, memory, um, serving as a stress moderator, um, and even improved behavior and certain symptoms of ADHD and other uh, kinds of issues were um, associated with exposure to and access to green space in a, in a regular and consistent way. And there is plenty of additional research that's underscoring the importance of physical activity and movement more generally and these improved outcomes as well. But I think the green space link there is particularly important. Um, we also know that outdoor play and green environments can impact mental health um, and outdoor play um, and that that relationship similarly has, uh, we see a connection to an improved school climate. So if we kind of draw some of these connections between um, exposure and access to green space, the opportunity for movement and physical activity, options for outdoor play. So I wanted to just highlight a little bit of that here, but opportunities to play and to be, um, for children to be able to have these outlets, we know that this can do wonders for just improving these various outcomes, but we also know that this, that these kinds of efforts also contribute to an improved climate as well, because we are saying that this is a, we're, we're reconceptualizing a little what school is about, what classrooms are about, that it is a place to learn, is it, it is a place to develop socially and emotionally. It is also a place to play. It is also a place to think and be creative. And so what I wanted to kind of, as I draw my par portion of this to a close, what I wanted to posit or at least bring to the table here is, is there a way in which we can imagine a learning environment that is first and foremost playful? Um, so that includes uh, filling, um, being filled with opportunities for play, for experimenting with different ideas, materials, norms, relationships, practices, how are ways in which can we, can we build that into our current classroom? So that's my first uh, question for you there. Um, my second is, can we imagine a learning environment that is positive? So if we go back to those indicators of positive school climate, what the research, what we know in the research shows and what you, what practitioners across schools would probably echo just based on their own experiences. Um, but having that shared vision of respect and engagement, um, placing an, emph an emphasis on collective um, safety and care, making that a priority, perhaps just as, if not more so than maybe other uh, priorities that schools sometimes have. How do, we, how do we invest in that as a way of saying, by doing so, we'll see long-term payoff academically, learning, socially, emotionally, and otherwise. So how do we rethink some of those priorities? Um, what if we imagine a learning environment that is sustainable? And so here I think about, again, going back to the research, increasing access to green spaces on and off campus. So um, school gardens, as you saw, um, participating in school programming efforts that take place in neighboring parks. So this happens quite a bit right now um, in the New York City public school system. And that's, um, it's not always possible given where a school it may be located, but for those schools that are within even a half a mile or so of a, of a green space, taking, adva taking advantage of that. Um, if it can't happen during the school day, how do we use that supplementary uh, education time, that after school time to promote those efforts um, and bring those efforts to our schools? Um, outdoor education opportunities. Um, and then even things like, there's some, there was a, some of the research actually spoke about the value of ha seeing greenery from a classroom window, what that does to just improve well-being among kids and how that matters. And so that's something to just think about. So playful, positive, sustainable. And then last but certainly not least, and this is certainly where my own, my broader work lies and what I think a lot about, but just health promoting. So efforts that promote outdoor play, physical movement of any kind, anything where children are, are developing an affinity for movement and for spending time with one another, um, advocating for more recess time. Um, right now, the average re amount of recess time 
uh, you know, is very, very small. Um, when you think about all that we're asking children to do each day and how the amount at which they need to stay still and focus, um, the level of recess time is far disproportionate, far less than it, it really should be. Um, and then taking advantage of any sort of green spaces. So that could be a school garden, that could be access to a local park, but using that to facilitate some new teaching opportunities and rethinking ways in which we might um, draw that into existing curricula. So this is really kind of my vision for how I think about climate, um, for how I think about a school environment, um, and ways in which I hope and, and that we can maybe work together to think about, um, you know, building our classrooms and schools moving forward in, in the spirit. So um, I will pause for the, a moment. And um, here's my, I'm, I'm putting my email here just so folks can uh, reach out if questions come to mind um, later. Thank you so much, Sonali. Um, so do send your questions to the Q&A button in Zoom and we will tackle them later. Um, thank you so much for that research and thank you for the prompts uh, to, to reimagine a learning environment. Um, to transition, as, as you all know, we have sustainability coordinators in place in every school in New York City. Um, to transition, I wanted to show you the results of um, answers to a question um, asked of the sustainability coordinators in the fall survey. And we asked, um, we asked them this, people have different opinions about impact of sustainability efforts on school. We are interested in your perspective. To what extent do you think that sustainability efforts affect each of the following? Um, and so the results of um, last fall survey was this. And as you can see, um, there's an overwhelming um, majority of sustainability coordinators that think that sustainability efforts really impact school environment that it also impacts, and you see the third one there, students' health and wellness, that it impacts teachers' health and wellness, and then below also, which also is very much related to school climate, that it impacts in a positive way uh, bullying and harassment um, to, to what the research that, that Sonali just underlined sort of um, supports as well. Um, and then just to, just to um, detail a little bit more is that the perceived impact of this, this effort is not associated with who the coordinator is, whether it's a teacher or an assistant principal or a different person. It's not related to the years as sustainability coordinators and the years at school. Um, so it's very much an, a sort of overwhelming opinion that, that sustainability creators really think that this matters. And so uh, the next two speakers that we have, and in the meantime, Paul has joined us here. Um, and uh, the next two speakers are sustainability coordinators in um, schools. And so let me um, quickly introduce Paul Clark, who is our next speaker. Um, Paul is a lifelong songwriter who took a substitute job teaching in the New York City schools in 1990. And his part-time position led to a full-time commitment as a special ed teacher. And for over 25 years, he worked with students across grade levels to heal their academic wounds and celebrate their unique gifts. And by integrating music and creating special projects, he thought outside the box. And under the creative leadership of a principal at PS50 who encouraged his strategy, Paul took the initiative to explore multi-component projects to address widespread and systematic hardship and challenges of the East Harlem community. So 12, year later, 12 years later, after raising funds for the Vito Marcantonio Community Peace Garden, the new auditorium and establishing many productive partnerships with providers and consultants who support the school sustainability efforts, he retired. But he now works two days a week at the peace, as the Peace Garden Coordinator and also as a nominal sustainability coordinator at Central Park East 2 under the progressive leadership of the new principal, Naomi Smith. So welcome, Paul. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and I think what you wanted to do is first um, listen to Yes, I thought we'd just song. jump right in with a song and some uh, images uh, I've collected over the years. So and we can just play it and yeah, we can talk do. a bit and take questions afterward. Perfect. Green's in the middle of the rainbow. Green's in between black and white. 
Green is the color that holds us together, the left wing and the right. Green is the color of money. Green is the color of the grass. Green is the color of leaves in the trees, and green is working class. Can we heal ourselves? Green, new deal. I saw a bumper sticker yesterday, Make America Green Again. Green Again. Red, white, and blue, and green again. More time, less me. We all did it. Green. Red and white and blue and green, yeah, we keep it strong, we keep it clean. Everyone who is living deserves to make a living. Green, new deal. and white. Green is the color that holds us together, the left wing and the right. Green's in the middle of the rainbow. Green is between black and white. Green is the color that holds us together. So thinking outside the box kept me from suffocating inside the box. <laughs> Institutions have a way of thwarting growth. And I think it's a challenge for educators to find and create conditions that allow humans to thrive. Uh, we use garden metaphors and Space, of course, is critical. Uh, we have calming exercises. Before we enter the Peace Garden, we call it butterfly wings. And basically, it's just a meditation to calm fingers and try and bring your body and your mind and your, your social group together. Um, there have been many challenges uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is leadership. Uh, school is hierarchical, and the tone trickles down from the top. So to move any project forward, you have to establish relationships. Uh, that can be very challenging when you don't share values with people. Um, on the other hand, school is a tremendous resource. The public system uh, infrastructure is, is the second largest in the country, second only to the military. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a visitor, actually, it was Colin Powell, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, with the American promise, America's promise. And what struck me was his vision of schools as community hubs, where education was just one of the functions of the school. 
and it provided health services, it provided daycare, it provided uh, curriculum, it provided resume training. Um, I, uh, our school was very fortunate to partner with uh, the Children's Aid Society. We were a community-based school. Uh, being a community school has allowed us to wrap around weekend programming, holiday programming, summer programming. Effectively, we had a 12-month uh, uh, school which allowed the garden programs to survive. Um, but I, I like to pick up a couple of words that I, I garnered from your presentation. Joy is critical. Good. Play is critical. It's not an add-on. Recess is critical. The, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I'm looking through a retired lens, <laughs> but it seems that children are more disturbed than ever. Uh, I wonder if it's media, if the social climate, if the division, if what is going on dietarily, environmentally, their level of hyperactivity. It's just an immense chaotic wave. And to try and calm that I really feel that is the prerequisite. That's like preparing the garden bed. You know, the soil has got to be rich enough to grow a plant. And the environment in the classroom has to be calm enough to form relationships, to hold conversations, for there to be continuity. There's just so much upheaval that wherever possible, we use some garden metaphors that are very helpful. Uh, trust, for instance, there's certain buzzwords schools use all the time, respect. I tell you, these are spectacles. <laughs> you go to watch a bath, you're a spectator, the inspector, what are they talking about? It's a verb to observe again. So if you can kind of revitalize these words and language, when language dies, education dies. And there's absolutely an attack on the way we use words. Um, so you begin to say, hey, if we're going to respect each other, we have to be Absolutely. in relation with each other. Yeah. It's a continuous process of observation. Re, again, trust. It's wonderful, etymologically, trust. So how can we bring this word alive? It derives from the word tree. Everyone has some response, association to a tree. So wherever possible, I'm using language. I work with kindergartens now. I started with middle school. but. Now, when I'm working with kids, it's like, how can I use language on a kindergarten level? You're expressing the concepts, but you're using language that doesn't alienate. Don't, for a minute, take for granted that the language you're using is reaching children. So again, it goes back to that continuous kind of, you know, assessment. It's, you know, and I saw too, you know, it was very interesting on that slide that the, uh, Sustainability coordinators were saying that it improved the school environment and the civic engagement, student civic engagement. You saw the slide where the kids were held in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost heartbreaking to see how students will rise to the occasion when they're getting real work. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're getting time kill work. They will destroy you. Mm -hmm. It's like intuitively we have a sense of what valuable work and play is. So the cafeteria story is very funny because we had, uh, I've worked in that school, as, it, as you said, uh, for 25 years, there were seven principals. Oh, wow. So you can imagine, one comes in, whoosh, out with the old and with the new. So it was crazy for, for many, many years. The school was finally closed. It was, you know, it failed. Under Bloomberg, they were going to close it. Under de Blasio and Carmen Farina, they created what they call renewal schools. Basically, they gave me three years and extra resources and hope to turn it around. Well, the renewal program didn't really pan out. But you can imagine what that can do. So we were at our heyday of cafeteria work as the green team. We children were this big with brooms that were this big. They were upside down in the garbage cans trying to make sure people were separated. It was adorable. And a new principal came in and said, get that, that program's out. I don't want kids holding garbage. Mm. And it was such a heartbreak because they were so deeply into it. I look at that picture 
it's almost the most moving one for me because I knew the, the enthusiasm behind that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does it say to kids when they're all into it? And, and same with it, uh, the 45 minute, you know, segmented compartment of classes. What life is not chopped up in blocks, but school is chopped in blocks. Mm -hmm. So our job is to stitch it back together. And I think relationships are trusting is, is the bottom line. Here. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Paul. Thank you for You're sharing welcome. that. Um, so we have one more speaker who will join us remotely, um, Shakira, um, who's uh, ready and standing by. I'll, I'll share that with Phoebe if she wants. I don't close that. Don't I, I'll find a way to Sorry, get you the song I mentioned about. Um, so let, let me introduce Shakira. Shakira is a K through five environmental science teacher at um, PS 3 and 33 in New York City. She began teaching 20 years ago as an early childhood classroom teacher before following her passion for the natural world. And she's a sustainability coordinator, heads the student green committee and the parent wellness committee and coaches track. And in addition, she teaches a New York Sun Works course on sustainability for New York City teachers, and she's written curriculum for New York Sun Works Greenhouse Project. Ms. Provisoli received a BA and an MSED from Sarah Lawrence College and a STEM certification from Teachers College through a NASA Endeavor Teaching Fellowship. In August 2016, Ms. Provisoli was honored at the White House receiving the Presidential Innovation Award for Environmental Education. She's currently a Math for America Fellow and a member of the New York City Elementary Science Leadership Team. So welcome, Shakira. We're so happy to have you as well. Thank you. And she's joining us from her classroom at the school, which is the Greenhouse. Oh, wow. Hi, everyone. Can you see me OK? So this is my classroom. Yeah. Um, I am both the environmental science teacher for kindergarten through fifth grade, as well as the sustainability coordinator. Um, as you can see, I have a really um, innovative classroom. This was the first New York Sunworks uh, lab. This is uh, the very first greenhouse they built, and they've since built um, probably about 60 more classroom labs. So this is my exciting classroom. Um, so I'm going to start off talking about um, the greenhouse, but I also wanted to uh, highlight some of the other work that we do as well. All right, so um, first of all, uh, we are a hydroponic rooftop greenhouse, um, but in this picture that you're seeing right here, this is actually the aquaponics tank. This is students who are fishing. And what I want to explain is that um, self-management is really crucial. So students start coming in fifth grade. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in kindergarten through fifth grade. And the first part of working in the classroom is actually learning how to be calm, even though there are exciting activities around. Um, students need to learn how to understand and manage their emotions and we don't always give them a lot of opportunities. When you think about all of the sit down tasks that they are asked to do every day, um, they really need time that requires the choice for control. So the next thing I wanna talk about are relationship skills. So these are some botany buddies, aren't they cute? Um, botany buddies are reading buddies that once in a while I will um, invite into the greenhouse classroom. Uh, since we're 1,400 square feet, there is room for two classrooms at a time. And sometimes they're just working together. Um, over here at the top, you'll see a boy uh, in fourth grade who is helping his first grade buddy uh, to clean what's called the NFT. Um, in the bottom picture, you'll see some older students are helping the kindergartners to make a plant part salad. Um, and sometimes it's just time to be together. They might come and read together in there. We might actually work outside together. And it's really crucial for kids to learn how to establish and maintain these positive relationships. So 
I make sure that there has to be opportunities for students to practice communication skills. They might ask each other survey questions. They might garden together. They might just help each other out. Um, they might teach each other how to work in the greenhouse or they might teach each other some recycling games. So if we don't give kids the time to learn these relationship skills, um, we're not really giving them um, the 21st century skills that we know that they need. So next I wanna talk about self-awareness. Um, so again, I said I work with kindergarten through fifth grade and I have to actually teach uh, how students look at themselves. Um, it's really important to teach this because students have to learn how to set and achieve positive goals. Now, most schools nowadays uh, have students of all ages set goals for themselves and they write it on a little paper and then they forget about it. So I have the students actually start off in September thinking about sustainability goals. So they start off asking themselves questions, um, what they are doing for the school um, with an environmental focus. So we call them a problem with the planet that they see at school. So they think about themselves, they observe others, um, and then hopefully they can come up with a way to improve. Um, the pictures that you're seeing here are some fourth graders who are thinking about TerraCycling. TerraCycle is a company that collects waste that you wouldn't normally be able to recycle. So the big ones that we collect are go-go squeezers, juice pouches, and the big one are foil wrappers. Uh, the student that you can see in this picture here who is dumping some foil wrappers into the bin, it is overflowing. Uh, we've been collecting from TerraCycle for about 10 years or so. And um, the last time I checked, we had collected 360,000 foil wrappers. So that's 360,000 foil wrappers that otherwise would have gone into a landfill. So it's pretty cool. Um, so this particular green team noticed that our program wasn't running as smoothly, and so they got new bins, they put new labels, they educated classes, and um, they work really hard to sort, and they actually ship everything off themselves. So pretty awesome. Um, and you know, they really know that they are uh, taking on an important role. So related to so self-awareness is then social awareness. So in the picture here, you can see that these fifth grade students, they won an award with the Zero Waste Schools. Um, we're not only just about you know, winning awards, but it is always exciting. Um, this particular group of students found a way to get all students' projects together. Um, and they made uh, weekly newsletters to show other people what these kids were working on. So as I mentioned before, I start off in September with kids looking at themselves, their classroom, the school, and every second through fifth grader has to find something they're passionate about and something that makes them mad that happens at our school um, about sustainability. So wasting water, wasting electricity, not recycling properly, wasting food, um, air quality, recycling, uh, terracycling, these are all issues that are pretty common. Um, and we're certainly not perfect, so there's a lot of problems that we can find. Um, so it's really, really important for kids to understand that they can take charge. So it's also um, important for kids to learn how to feel and show empathy for others. And we don't always teach this. Um, when you were in, you know, pre-K, K, uh, you're taught this, but as kids get older, it's assumed that they know it. But with all of the sit-down activities, the independent screen activities that kids are engaging in on a daily basis, there's not always opportunities for them to think about how their actions affect others. And if they don't think about this, then students can't take responsibility for the planet. So before students can become activists, they have to learn to love their planet. And this is one way that we're doing it. Um, so I think I, so I wrote on there some examples of ways they teach others or they may make a news show, they might make a game board, a newspaper, town hall speeches. 
I really encourage kids to think about their talents. I say, what are you really good at? What do you love to do? You love to draw? Great. Make a comic to show us where to put things when you want to throw things out. You are a drama kid? Great. Make a new show and I'll videotape you. And lastly, I want to talk about responsible decision making. So it's not just about thinking about yourself and learning how to communicate. It's the so what, taking it to the next level. So um, the student right here that you see, we are at a nature goals party at the REI store in Soho. And we went to help celebrate the parks department's new nature goals. We went and we signed the nature declaration and students spoke. This was actually during vacation, um, obviously not something they had to do, but it's something that they felt really passionate about. So taking it to the next level. It's not enough anymore to just make a pretty poster and hang it up. It's really getting people to change their behaviors. And I have students who come during their recess time, they write letters to local politicians. Uh, I have fourth graders who are working on a newspaper to be sent out to families to get people to stop using single-use plastic. Um, I just, I really feel that students' lives are so scheduled and managed by adults. It's really important for them to know that they can take charge. And I think that we can understand that self-driven projects are the ones that really will have the most impact both on the student and on our world. I think that passive children might love the earth. That's one of my goals is to help kids love nature, help love the planet, but they might not feel that urge to create change. So besides educating others, our students write letters to elected officials, speak at events like this, and our passionate students at Manhattan School for Children, they are taught how to seek out problems, how to brainstorm solutions, and how to build their own future. So thank you for listening. I hope the work of my students has inspired you to create change as well. And um, I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Akira. Um, so it's, it's always very inspiring to see what is going on in, in schools and, and um, I'm positive that all of the examples we've seen today from both Paul and um, Shakira and combined with the research of Sonali uh, will inspire many. Um, there was a question of sharing Paul's song earlier and yes, this, this is a recorded session so you will, can find it on our website later. Um, but first I wanted to open the floor for questions. Greens and... Oh, so I can move to the next. There we go. Questions. So we had one question that was sent to us in. Ooh, I can go back to it. There we there go. We go. Question from Greg. Uh, where does lightning, lighting, lightning, lighting fit in? Dimming, allowing lighting intensity control issues related to flickering fluorescent lighting versus LED, more natural light. Um, if anybody wants to tackle that question. We have a critical problem in the garden at the moment because the exterior construction has a debris shield. So the school has been wrapped essentially in a shroud for three years. Uh, so occluded light in the garden, of course, has limited uh, and stunted growth. Uh, we had to get uh, grow lights for, for plants. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the ear flickering lights. Uh, uh, again, a uh, principal came in and the first thing she did was change the lights to make the school brighter. Mm -hmm. And it, it seemed irrespective of every other consideration, brightness was, was the value and it's blindingly bright. Uh, so I, uh, I empathize with dimming lights and allowing more natural light allows the day to, to kind of flow. These lights can really be oppressive. And I'm just, just an observation more that I'm sure that 
I don't know if your school in particular might be struggling with this, but I see it all the time across the city. I think we all do just the scaffolding and all of that around a lot of schools. So it does just that, you know, there's construction and um, I think right at, actually at PS333 there is, there's like all the scaffolding right outside the building and it's been there for, right Shakira, I think it's been there for years from what I can remember. And so this idea that, that just the way in which I think urban schools in particular have to be sort of creative in this. I don't, I don't, I have no solutions. I'm just offering the problem as well, but I, it's something I've seen as well. It's just like a physical hindrance. So. Oh yeah. And psychological. And psychological, you really absolutely. Just yeah. shut off. Shakira, do you want to weigh in with what's happening in the greenhouse? Uh, sure. So um, we, yes, we actually have scaffolding. Um, you might even see people outside. We have construction going on. Um, and uh, as you can see, the actual is still shining through right now. I don't have the lights on. Obviously for students, we know that natural light is best. So whenever possible in the classroom, using the shades. Um, but if you do have to have lighting, then LED, LED would be the best. And it's also going to save money as well, which is a really wonderful one. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? Panelists, do you have questions for each other? <laughs> I'd like to visit Shakira's uh, greenhouse. Yes, is is Manuel Zam uh, Zamora, she, with the Sunworks program, she designed our garden too at, uh, at Central Park East too. Okay. But we've been un unable to use it because the exterior construction is, is taking place on the roof and there have been leaks into the uh, hydroponic. Our garden is dual level. We have a soil level and a hydroponic mezzanine. We haven't been able to use the hydroponic system this year. Uh, one question though, do you allow students in your uh, hydroponic greenhouse without adult supervision? Well, it's a, we're an elementary school, so there's never a time that students wouldn't be with a teacher. Uh -huh. Like you wouldn't have students in any classroom without a teacher. Right, um, right. So, uh, no, <laughs> uh, there's always students here. Um, they come during their lunchtime, they come during their recess time. Um, and and uh, I see about 650 students a week. And wow. um, yeah, we have a lot of projects that we work on. I didn't even, I didn't even get to the half of it with everything um, uh, that we do in here. Are you the sole uh, provider teacher in the garden? So I am uh, the K to five teacher. The uh -huh. sixth and eighth grade students are also scheduled to come in once a week with their teachers. Um, and then uh, New York Center Works provides maintenance assistance for me. Do you have to integrate your garden uh, teaching with the science curriculum? Yes, I am, I am the science teacher. So yes, everything that, everything that we do uh, is revolved about science with an environmental focus. Uh, we need the sustainability into everything that we do, um, but um, yeah, every, everything everything has to do with the with the greenhouse. How does your uh, principal support you? <laughs> uh, maybe that's a, for another. Time. Just I'm not quite sure. <laughs> you mean you're just fully supported? It's not. Yes. Or it's not an issue. Okay, that's it's not always the case. Shakira, this that's amazing, like yeah. really amazing. Yeah, yeah. We have that sign. We're proud of New York Sunworks greenhouse. <laughs> that's great. I love uh -huh. it. Um, any more questions from our participants? Um, I want to visit. Yeah, same. <laughs> I want to visit. Yes. Yeah. It sounds great. Right. So then I think the time has come to wrap it up. Thank you so much for our, to our participants. Thank you to our fabulous panelists. Um, upon leaving the webinar, you will receive a link for a very short survey. Please um, make sure to fill it out. 
Um, and we hope to see you at future webinars. We have one more scheduled in June. So please visit our website, um, www.tc.columbia.edu, sustainability for more information and where you can also find recordings of our past webinars. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.